All right, so now that we have gone through energy and we've talked about enzymes and reactions and cells and um, chemistry, we're now going to kind of put this all together in a biochemical reaction, which is photosynthesis. And photosynthesis, of course, is the engine uh, which fuels all life um, on Earth. Okay, lots of things photosynthesize. We've got plants, we've got cyanobacteria, algae, um, and of course, this is the basis of our food web. So, photosynthesis, again, it's the, um, the ultimate or the source of all energy um, on the Earth. And the equation for it is we have carbon dioxide, which we combine with water, and light, so we use energy from light to make sugar molecules, C6H12O6, um, and then we have a byproduct of water and oxygen. Okay, so there are different types of photosynthesis, but the ones using oxygen um, is carried out by cyanobacteria algae and all land plants and land plants have a specific organ called organelle called a chloroplast chloroplast when you break it down into its different parts it has an internal membrane called the thylakoid membrane okay you can see that here Oops, sorry you can see that here and that has a pigment called chlorophyll it has other pigments as well but these are clustered into photosystems specific areas within the membrane for gathering light. Now these thylakoid membranes are folded over in stacks called grana and they have connections between them called the stroma lamella and the stroma then is the liquid kind of like the cytoplasm which surrounds the thylakoid membranes um, which is the solution for um, ions and things which are important for photosynthesis to occur. All right, now there are two general stages, and there's many stages within these stages, but the two um, stages of photosynthesis that we can separate it into are the light-dependent reactions, where light is required in order for the process to occur. Um, and during this, th these reactions, you capture energy from sunlight, you make ATP, which is our energy molecule, and you reduce NADP plus to NADPH. So you're adding um, an electron to NADP plus to make NADPH. And that is then storing potential energy in that ATP and NADPH. The light independent reactions, they used to be called the dark reactions, but they can actually occur in the light as well. So we call them light independent because they don't need the light to occur. Um, it uses the ATP and the NADPH from our light-dependent reactions to synthesize organic molecules um, from carbon dioxide. So they string together carbon from carbon dioxide molecules um, and make them into sugars. So pigments then are molecules that absorb light in the visible range and light is a form of energy, and the photon is a particle of light. Okay, so we'll refer to photons when we talk about energy from the sun. The photoelectric effect then is you can remove an electron from a molecule because of the energy from light. So when a photon hits uh, a substance, it causes an electron to be excited, um, and as it comes back down, it will give off uh, energy in the form of light and that's the photoelectric effect. Alright, so some of the pigments which are important to photosynthesis include chlorophyll A. And this is the main pigment in plants in cyanobacteria which gives it that green color. And it's the only pigment that can directly use light energy and convert it to chemical energy to um, excite electrons. Chlorophyll B is an accessory pigment, meaning it's uh, accessory to chlorophyll A. Its purpose is to provide energy to chlorophyll A so it can excite that electron. Uh, it does not absorb 
um, does not absorb the same wavelengths that chlorophyll B, chlorophyll A does. And we also have carotenoids, which can absorb photons with a wide range of energies and pass them on to chlorophyll A. So the structure of chlorophyll, uh, again, relates to its function. It has a porphyrin head or a porphyrin ring, which is a complex ring structure with a magnesium in the middle and uh, a ring of double bonds and single bonds surrounding it. So that's what we have over here circled in red. This is important because this is where the um, excitation of the electron occurs. The other part, um, and then uh, electrons are shuttled away from the ring towards an electron acceptor. The other part is the hydrocarbon tail, and that makes it uh, able to be embedded within the lipid membrane uh, because it has a hydrophobic tail there. So then the absorption, absorption spectrum um, is the spectrum of light in which uh, photosynthesis is using light for energy. When a photon strikes a molecule, um, uh, it has a few options. It can just bounce around and then just be lost as heat, or it can be absorbed by electrons of the molecules and boost those electrons to a higher energy level. Okay, so then the absorption spectrum, again, is the range and efficiency of photons a molecule is capable of absorbing. So these molecules, meaning the different, um, the different pigments, have a different range in which they can absorb photons. Okay, and you can see there is some overlap between chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and carotenoids, but having all of them gives you a much wider range of um, a much wider absorption spectrum by which you can absorb energy from light. So part of the um, light reaction depends on the photosystem organization. And one of the parts in the photosystem is the antenna complex. And this acts kind of as a place to funnel energy. Um, and it has uh, hundreds of accessory pigment molecules, again that's chlorophyll B and carotenoids, and they gather these photons and pass them along to the reaction center. So just like an an what an antenna does on the TV, they don't have these, um, they aren't shaped this way anymore, but it funnels the signal into a central location. The reaction center then has one or more chlorophyll A molecules, which are able to excite the electrons out of the photosystem. So the light dependent reaction has two parts, the primary photo event and the charge separation. And then the other two are the electron transport and chemiosmosis. Okay. And so we'll go through these, um, individually. First, again, the antenna complex is also called the light harvesting complex because it captures photons from sunlight and channels them to that reaction center of chlorophyll A. In chloroplasts, the light harvesting complex consists of a web of chlorophyll molecules linked together and held tightly in the thylakoid membranes. Remember that from the anatomy of the chloroplast. Okay, so a matrix of proteins is holding that um, reaction center within the thylakoid membrane. Now, within each of the reaction centers or next to them, you have a transmembrane protein pigment complex. Remember, a transmembrane protein is an integral plasma membrane protein. And when a chlorophyll in the reaction center absorbs a photon of light, it is excited to a higher energy level. Okay? What makes photosynthesis possible is you have electron donors and electron acceptors, which um, are able to move these electrons. And as they are moved um, down energy levels, you can use that energy as it moves down. So light is excited by, by light excites an electron. It is accepted by an electron acceptor. 
and then a donor will give another electron um, to the reaction center and then that will be bumped up to a higher energy level as well through light. So each of these then um, is necessary. You have to have this area, this reaction center, this chlorophyll molecule that can be excited by light and jump that electron to a higher energy level. Once it's at this higher energy level, it can be accepted by an electron acceptor and then the electron donor can replace that electron. Okay, so um, there is there are different ways of, of photosynthesis to occur depending on the different type of organism. One is called cyclic phos photophosphorylation, and it's cyclic because it just kind of goes through this same um, the electron gets excited and is passed down and gets excited again, and so it kind of stays within the same photosystem. So this happens in sulfur bacteria. You only have this one photosystem and generates ATP via electron transport. There's no oxygen required for this, and it the electron is passed on an electron transport chain, which creates a proton gradient for ATP synthesis. Okay, so this one's a little more simple than what we're going to focus most of our time, and that's the non-cyclic photophosphorylation. This uses two photosystems, so two areas where you are able to um, capture energy from sunlight and excite an electron. So photosystem two is first, photosystem one is, is next. Um, so they're kind of backwards. The photosystem is replenished with electrons, so the initial electron donor is water. And what happens is um, chlorophyll is able to split water into hydrogen ions, electrons, and oxygen. The oxygen, after it's split, is not used for anything. Oh, well, it can be used for respiration, but it's not used for anything in photosynthesis. Um, the hydrogens are important because it can help create a, pho um, a photon gradient. And the electrons are important because when you excite them and then pass them down, they can be used for energy as well. So this is what we'll draw in class, which is called a Z diagram. It's more like an M diagram, but um, we'll go through these different steps. All right, this is uh, the electron transport steps are required. Um, it requires oxygen, so it's oxygenic photosynthesis. Um, the first photosy uh, photosystem is the P700. So we're going to go through that one, even though in class we'll go through them in the other way. And it functions a lot like the sulfur bacteria. Um, and then photosystem 2 uh, can, is, can generate an oxidation potential high enough to oxidize water. So water is used for photosystem 2, not in photosystem 1. Working, the, working together, they can make ATP and NADPH, which holds potential energy, which we can use in the light independent reactions. So in photosystem one, the end result is you get NADP reduced NADPH. An electron is donated to NADP and are replaced from a donor called plastocyanin over here. So plastocyanin donates the electron into photosystem one. Uh, the reaction center consists of a complex of a bunch of proteins with some chlorophyll molecules, P700 chlorophyll molecules. They accept that, um, that um, electron. Uh, it's excited by light. It's then accepted by ferredoxin, which then um, uses then it's used to uh, by an enzyme NADP reductase, which reduces NADP plus into NADPH. Photosystem two resembles the reaction center of purple bacteria and is cyclic. Okay, there's 10 transmembrane protein subunits with a chlorophyll molecule called P680. And the reaction center has four manganese atoms essential for the splitting or oxidation of water. Um, it excites these electrons, is then 
accepted by plastiquinone, which then passes it on to BF, B6F complex, which um, pumps protons through and creates a concentration of protons on one side of the membrane in the thylakoid lumen. After you get all these protons then on one side, you then create a gradient. So naturally they want to diffuse through to where there's a low concentration of them. Um, and as they do that, um, you can use them with ATP synthase to make ADP into ATP. Okay, and this also allows, so it allows these protons to diffuse through facilitated diffusion through ATP synthase. As they do so, they kind of turn the crank on this um, process of making ADP into ATP, which is then available for energy. All right, so here's the whole process from the figure in your book. Um, and we will go over this in class, and it'll be fun. All right, so that's the light dependent reactions. And then the light independent reactions um, is used to build carbohydrates. Okay, it uses energy, um, ATP from the light dependent reactions, and hydrogens from the NADPH to make these sugars. It was named after a guy named Melvin Calvin, um, and it's also called C3 photosynthesis, this Calvin cycle. The key step is the attachment of carbon dioxide to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate by phosphate, or RUBP, to form a 3-phosphoglycerate PGA. So you can use these abbreviations. It uses an enzyme called ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. You can just call it Rubisca, though, and there it is there. There are three phases to it. The first one is carbon fixation. So you see that right here. That's where you take carbon dioxide with rubulose 1,5-bisphosphate and you make 3-phosphoglycerate, PGA. That is then reduced to a molecule called glycealdehyde 3-phosphate, G3P, and then that is regenerated back to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. Okay, if you do this three turns with so you get three carbon dioxides that's enough to make one g3p if you do it six times that's enough to make one glucose or one fructose if you do it 12 times that's enough to make one sucrose okay so um, the, each time you add a carbon to your um, end molecule glucose is not a direct output of the of the Calvin cycle though. G3P is the three carbon molecule which is used to form sucrose which is used to make starch. Alright so photosynthesis then uses the products of respiration which are water and carbon dioxide as starting substrates and respiration uses the products of photosynthesis which is oxygen and sugar um, to, to make energy available for use, to make ATP. So sometimes you, there, there is a problem when photosynthesis occurs, and this is called carboxylation, sorry. This is called photorespiration. So the enzyme Rubisco has two uh, enzymatic activities, or two things it can do as an enzyme. It can add carbon dioxide, which is what we talked about before, to RUBP, and this is favored under normal conditions, but when it gets too hot, photorespiration occurs. And that's where you have oxidation of RUBP, which is kind of the backwards thing that you don't want, by the addition of an oxygen. Um, and so this creates a low carbon dioxide environment and a high oxygen environment, which isn't good for a carboxylation. So if you want photosynthesis to be made into sugars, then this isn't good. Um, so when things get too hot, the stoma will close um, and then photosynthesis will essentially stop. Um, and the reason why this is because carbon dioxide and oxygen, oxygen compete for the same active site on uh, RUBP, on Rubisco. So 
To avoid this, there are two different um, strategies by plants. In C3 plants, they just use the Calvin cycle, the C3 photosynthesis, and they close their stomata when it gets too hot. In C4 plants, what they do is make they <coughs> four carbon sugars. Um, one of them right here is called malate. Okay, and then so during light dependent reactions, they make a bunch of these malate uh, molecules, and they use a different um, enzyme called PEP carboxylase, which has a greater affinity for carbon dioxide, and it doesn't get mixed up with the oxygen. Okay, but it does require more energy, so it's less efficient. But if it's too hot, um, it's more efficient than the C3 photosynthesis. So plants that live in very arid environments that are very hot use the C4 uh, method. And what they do then is they, they have two separate compartments, one for the light-dependent reactions, where they make a bunch of this malate, and then that malate could then be passed on to the bundle sheath cell, which is away from the mesophyll cell, and that malate can donate a carbon dioxide to be used in the Calvin cycle. Okay, and then it can be regenerated um, by going through the light-dependent reactions. Another um, strategy is, is uh, cam plants. So these are also found in arid environments. And what they do is during the daytime, they um, it's so hot that they will close their stomata and um, and then they will store up all this malate in the daytime and then at the nighttime they will open their uh, open their stomata and perform the, the, the Calvin cycle. So cam plants, sorry, cam plants do the same thing as C4 plants but they open and close their stomata at night and at day. So they open their stomata in the, in the nighttime when it's not so hot and they will close it in the daytime so they don't wilt and lose water. All right, that's it for photosynthesis. A lot of stuff. We'll break it up in a couple days and learn some more about it in class.